First of all, I dedicate this talk to Stephen Hawking, one of the greatest thinkers of our universe, and also to my father, who is the greatest thinker of my universe, and who joins us today, of course, here in the audience. Look around you. What do we see? Things, stuff. The wood panels on this auditorium. When the human species started learning the art of chiseling wood from trees and putting it to use for their own conveniences. The plastic or the steel chairs that you sit on. A very, very complicated hydrocarbon amalgamation of polymer chains that results in plastic heated at a very high temperature to ultimately yield plastic chairs. Steel, when the Homo sapiens, as we know them today, learned the idea of forging using temperature, the iron node that the earth emanates. The list is endless. And of course, all the complicated things, such as this mic, computers, PC, light, cameras, etc., etc. We are programmed to use these things as users. That's fair enough. But the believer, the thinker, and the inventor that resides in all of us, unfortunately, is fading away at an unprecedented rate. The process of making things, just making stuff, emanates from a journey. It starts the journey of finding, finding a problem, finding a roadmap that could potentially lead you to some sort of a solution, but above all, finding an inspiration. The great Indian mathematician Ramanujan would often be heard saying something to the tune of, the goddess whispers the equations into my ear. That could well be interpreted today that his inspiration came from something that was remotely disconnected with mathematics. And once the inspiration came, the rest everything followed. The process of finding an inspiration to make things is actually a fairly interesting journey for some of us. To borrow the lines of Elon Musk, it's like crushed, it's like eating crushed glass. It's like walking barefoot on a cold bed. It's like going to bed on a bed of nails. It's like chartering the unknown territory. And for some of us, it's a magical place to be. Many inventors over the years have looked at nature for inspiration. So let's just walk through a couple of them. You know, the, the French Concorde aeroplane, which was the finest aeroplane probably that got built, derives its inspiration from the nose of a dolphin, which is essentially what makes it very, very special. The supersonic train in Japan, which can travel even faster than the speed of sound, would hit a sonic boom because it was traveling so fast. The only way to solve that problem was to almost get inspired by the shape of a beak of a kingfisher. And that's what this looks like today, which helps circumvent around this problem of sonic boom. Engineers and inventors today look at lizards and geckos to see how such a tiny little insect or an amphibian can actually have such a strong holding power and they use that for making present-day adhesives. Fire-resistant materials derive their engineering inspiration from certain saps that are literally leaked by certain trees that have survived millions of years on this earth, such as the sequoia trees. And they've survived all sorts of fires that have happened over the millennia. Architects today have turned to anthills to look at how such an anthill built without any computer simulations can be naturally air conditioned or naturally air cooled. And they're using that inspiration for building buildings around us today. My inspiration has a distinct parallel. I wanted to see in this connected world today, where economies connect, countries are getting closer together in trade. What is it India has a fundamental reliance on from rest of the world. And the number one item list on the top of that big list was oil. 
So if you see, more than 70 to 80% of our oil requirements actually come from outside of the country. Now that's interesting. Uh, we do have a roadmap in place to utilize solar energy to reduce that oil consumption. But this is the reason this is very, very important. Oil, apart from being used for transportation in our country, 40% of it actually is used by industries simply for making heat, for generating heat. That heat is used for all manufacturing processes for everything and anything that you see around yourselves today. And that is the same heat that is responsible for at least 45% of carbon emissions in our own country. And of course, we need to address that situation for a sustainable future for our own selves. We have solar panels today, uh, which are a long list of uh, plates that you see, which utilize the effect of light. But most of these panels are not manufactured in India, more than 80%. So we have simply shifted our import bill from oil to solar. We haven't done much well for ourselves, I guess. So the question I asked, for a country which has more than 300 days of sunshine, Aryabhatta came from our nation, so engineering principles, the principles of physics go back way long. Why do we have this reliance of this fuel? Can we not make something for our own selves that address the needs of our own industries that will help reduce the fossil fuel consumption in industries for heat and reduce the carbon emissions that are associated with it? Heat is very important. This is how we did it in 1800s. This is how we do it today. We take fuel, we burn it, we get heat, and that's how pretty much things have happened over the past 300 years. Haven't come very far. So we looked at where is the place in nature that I could find heat generation without using any fuel, without having any emissions. And we looked at a five rupee or 10 rupee lens that could concentrate the incoming energy from a large surface area to a very small one, thereby achieving very high temperatures, enough to put a paper to combust instantly. And if you were naughty enough, some of you, you would probably even use this to burn ants. The next step we recognized after concentrating energy that we needed to stay focused. But I wanted to build a large industrial lens that did not require a lot of area for installation. So we looked at our next sense of inspiration from nature, and that is trees. Look at the span of this tree. It's probably about 40 to 50 meters, but look at its ground footprints. It's barely two to three meters. Nature has solved the structural engineering problems in a very, very finessed way. Here is a test of time that has withstood all sorts of calamities of weather. I knew what to do. Stay grounded. That was the next design criteria. Stay focused, like the lens. Stay grounded, like the tree. The problem was, how do we make such a large structure that actually takes all these mirrors and lenses that will allow us to concentrate the incoming energy? So we turned to the nature's finest structural engineer. Of course, we had a little problem. This thing and I didn't speak the same language. But nevertheless, the magical part of a spider is a spider web. Look at how stiff this structure is. This is all available in nature just for us to see. The radial beams that emanate from a center and all tied together by circular rings makes it one of the most stiff constructions for its size. I knew what to do, stay connected. Of course, it would be quite meaningless to have such a large industrial lens that could generate that heat to displace the fossil fuels in industries without having much high efficiency. So this thing needed to look at the sun to capture a lot of energy. And once again, I turned to nature to find an inspiration. The sunflower has no motors, no gears, no complicated engineering. Still, the microcapillary action that happens inside the stem allows the sunflower to move towards the sun. Look at the sun, morning, evening, sunshine, day after days, years after years, without anybody telling it to do so. So I knew what to do. 
keep moving. So with all these ideas, putting four years of toils and engineering and pains, we put all this together, we drew things up, we sketched things up, and we went to some friends and family and asked for money because we wanted to make this big, giant industrial lens in India. Some friends came along and trusted us, and they put money in. So here I was carrying the weight of not only engineering and technology, but also the weight of their expectations. And finally, after all this effort of making things, making things in the lab, breaking them, putting new ideas, going to places, going to villages, towns, getting the right kind of materials in, we made what I would want to call a very unique industrial lens. And this is what this thing looks like. It looks like a satellite dish, but it's a large piece of equipment. To put this perspective, it's 12 meters in diameter. That will probably dwarf the length of this chair right here to that part of the auditorium. That's the size of this thing. It takes the incoming energy and it concentrates onto a receiver point. And at the focus of this lens, we get extremely high temperatures enough to melt steel. Just like a 10 rupee lens did. It was wonderful. Look at the area of this large industrial lens. Very small, just like a tree. So here's a 100 square meter dish occupying one square meter on ground. It was very exciting. We had a lot of people. We installed this. We uh, ran this for almost a year. Great data came out. It was one of the highest efficiency lenses. Ministry people, friends from industries, everybody joined in to congratulate us, to join us in this journey. And it seemed like it was all adding up. Until one fine day, where I received a call from our site and said, you need to come there first thing in the morning. Excited by their new visitors to enjoy our new toy, I rushed to the site, only to find something like this. The wind struck the dish, and it came striking down. All the mirrors were dashed and broken, and it seemed like so was my dream. It's, it's funny, it, I derived the inspiration from nature, and the nature almost played a trick on me. So we went back, we looked at what went wrong, we did the math, and we realized we missed out one small event that would probably not happen once in 100 years of a specific uh, wind speed, but it indeed happened. So the lesson to be learned is if anything has a non-zero probability in your life, it is bound to happen till the time it is non-zero. And this is a live example. Dreams were shattered. This was almost five and a half years of efforts, money, time, gone. And there were the two folk in front of me in the road. One, give it all up, do something more meaningful with my life, or dust myself back up and just be at it again. I chose the latter, foolishly. After another two years of efforts and putting all the engineering and learning from the failures that we saw in that one dish, we came up with what is today one of the world's lightest large industrial lens concentrators. And here it is right in front of you. Uh, it's one of the most efficient ones. It's very light, takes a very small footprint on ground. And I'm glad to share this with you. It's been recognized by the who's who in our country, adopted for their own requirements in industries. It's been used in rural areas for doing solar cooking. It's been used by municipalities for evaporation of waste water, which is such a menace in our, in our country. It is used to generate drinking water from seawater, a process that we call desalination, which requires heat. Why is all of this important? The world looked towards our country, India, as we chart out our growth plan for the future in a sustainable way. We're almost sitting in the leader's seat for the world to follow. Such indigenous, 100% made in India technologies would certainly create a major impact in sustainable growth for our own country. And of course, also reverse the technology trend so that we can send these things out of India for the rest of the world to adopt. And I'm happy to report and share this with you that it's actually beginning to happen. Almost a decade of doing this. Today, I look back and recognize what is it that I've learned. 
What is it that I've learned that I can share? And here are a couple of thoughts. We know what we do know, but we do not have a clue about what we're not aware of. And all the magic lies in the unknown. So go out there, ask the nonsensical questions, be unreasonable, get out there, make things, let them fail, let them bring your do ha hopes dashing down. Pick yourself up again, build it again. Do not take anybody's words for an answer. Do it yourself. It is the only way we can continue our journey from apes to astronauts. If not for your own self, do it for the sake of humanity. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.